Hello, my name is Big Root Jake, and I am uh, pleased to announce that I'm going to be on the Jimmy Fannin Show. Is that what you call it, Jim? Jim Fannin Show. The yeah. Jim Fannin Show. It's really a great show. Uh, Jim's an old friend of mine from many, many years ago, and uh, I'll come in here and play some tunes and uh, talk about some new recordings and talk about my adventures in the music industry and talk about the things that Jim and I hold in common and things that we don't hold in common and... Uh, and uh, we just did a pre-interview, and it was awesome. So it's going to be great. By the way, tonight I'm playing at the Mate Cafe in downtown St. Catharines at 241 St. Paul Street. Um, please stop by tonight and uh, listen to me sing my songs. Yeah, what time are you going on? I think we're going on at 7.30. It's just me on the acoustic, so it should be easy to set up. And But you never know. You know, we might wait till it's quarter to 8 or something like that. But right. Thanks, brother. All right, Love cheers. You, right on. Thanks for coming in, brother. Well, thank I appreciate you, very you much. making the trip. That's cool. It's been a long time since we've been together, man. We were just talking about that before we went here. I'm just going to make sure that all our feeds are live here. And uh, how's your life, man? Everything good? Pull that mic up. Everything's really good. Thanks. Pull that mic up to you. You want me to yeah, pull it up yeah, like so? Okay, that's great. Thanks. All right. Yeah. So it looks like we're uh, YouTube's going over there, Facebook's going live over there, and cool. we'll upload it with the better sound. Later. All right. Well, I just might during this process, I might just text somebody and tell them to tune in. Yeah. No, you know they can I mean? find that it. Right? Gym, yeah. Absolutely. If no I'd rules, known, bro. Dude, if I'd have known, you had it so together. <laughs> I'd, I'd have gotten my act together myself. You know what they say, Jake? A bit, you know fake what I mean? it till you make it. If it did, <laughs> <laughs> if you look like you got your shit together, you got your shit together. There's no. Uh, no well, there's a lot of people. Who, I, there's a lot of people who I want to see this, so I'm just going to send a little. I'm gonna yeah, send a absolutely. Right now, and thanks for picking up the guitar too. I didn't oh, you're expect welcome. you to actually play, but uh, you got a gig tonight at Mate Cafe, That's one right. of my favorite venues. Intimate. Yes. Uh, right on the drag of St. Paul Street, uh, St. Paul Street downtown St. Catharines. That's right. So I think you, it's two four one St. Paul yeah, Street. You can like it right at the corner of Garden Park. So uh, have you played there before? I have. A couple oh, okay, of times. you have. Okay, maybe okay. twice. Okay, nice. Yeah. Nice yeah. place. Chris is a great host there. He is. Uh, basically, one of the reasons why I picked it is because I am making the move um, towards doing more folk music type venues. Oh, really? And there's and there's a reason for that that I'm so glad you let me on my show on your show to talk about because oh, uh, I'm I understand to have there's you. a couple of people who are actually who watch this podcast who are actually big Rude Jake fans. Yeah, yeah. I I didn't know, but That's uh, awesome. a girlfriend of mine just said. Well, she was. I thought she was telling me I was hot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like burning. I'm <laughs> burning. She's like, no, not you. Maybe uh, Jake is hot. She <laughs> says, come on, admit it. I go, well, dude, it's been years. So I'll, I'll look again. I'll reassess. You know, <laughs> I, so, I usually got an eye for handsome men. Well, there you yeah. go. <laughs> for me, basically, uh, I sort of went through a realization that I was dissatisfied with some of the results I was getting because over the years my band has been so spectacular and I use that word very specifically like not spectacular and like like they they create the spectacle when they perform and the spectacle is so uh remarkable and overwhelming that a lot of times the songs themselves the power behind the songs was lost and uh, I just got so tired of people assuming that we were only doing covers. And I really wanted people to understand that the reason why I do this is because I want to be a songwriter. I want to be recognized as a songwriter, and I want to share my songs with everyone. Hmm. Everyone in the English-speaking world, I want them to hear these songs and enjoy them and get something out of them. Mm -hmm. So I decided I'm going to do more and more folk music venues. I'm just going to take the old acoustic. I'm going to take oh, it on the road, okay. and I'm going to play rooms. And I say, my name is Big Rude Jake, and I write songs, and here's one for you. Wow. And so when you told you know, I had the guitar in the car. When you told me, oh, we're going live, like people are going to be able to hear me do it now, then mm -hmm. I just grabbed the guitar because I've been listening to you talk, and I think i got a couple of songs that will appeal to you specifically. Uh -huh. And my struggles. Yes, you and your personal <laughs> Well, you don't struggles. have to listen to me or watch very long. <laughs> no, I struggle in many departments, man. Um, yeah, so that, that the struggle is real. So, yeah, I appreciate your time. And uh, what else you got going on? We, we, we go back. We're just trying to figure out when it is. It must be the 02 or 03. Yes. I think it was my first Landmark Forum. Yes. Because I went through the forum twice. Oh, you did? I, yeah. And then uh, I've done the whole curriculum. Right. I did uh, the advanced course in the SELP. Uh, uh, the, oh, yes, yes. 
Self Which was to me the big one, the number three, the third yeah, one. Yeah, that's big what one. you thought it was the self expression leadership program? That's the one. That's the where, in my opinion, that's where the rubber hits the road with that program. Really? Well, Up until that's, that point, yeah, it's just that's a bunch when you of get to put ideas. all your learning into action. Exactly. But what blew me, well, the, the forum blew me away. That, that was something that I was not prepared for, and it dramatically uh, affected the rest of my life. Like, I still carry a lot of that with me. And it's weird because now when you connect with a landmark forum participant that's graduated, you're on a different level, man. You you can speak in a way that most people don't understand as yes. far as integrity, honoring your word. Uh, you know, there's just Personal so responsibility. much. responsibility. Yeah, and, and they use the words in different ways, like possibility is a new word. Inventing is a new, you know, they, they're they not the same context as we use them out in the regular English language. That's right. Uh, so I, I'm I always was, intrigued when I get reconnected with somebody that I met in the forum because we, we have a base knowledge of that education that, well, many out in the world don't have. Like how many times you bump into somebody and you go, hey, have you ever taken a landmark forum? And you're right. Yeah. You know, it's very seldom. And yeah. so I appreciate that. And, uh, uh, and you being in politics, at the risk of sounding cynical, the political environment is almost the opposite. Because so much, of, especially of contemporary politics, is about blame. Mm. And it's Amen. about thrust saying, you want to fix things? Those guys are the problem over there. And there's so little personal responsibility yes. today. And th that's, man, if they cut something off, as soon as you walk in that room, it's that right yeah. there. It's like, I was late because my kids, because of the what? No, you were late because you... Because it wasn't important to you, yeah. basically. Yeah, because you weren't in action on being on and time. And there's not a lot of people that have that level of integrity that are ready to get that responsible for their way of being yeah. and the impact. And yeah. So that's stuff that I've carried uh, forward into my life that's been, you know, I told you the collapsing of the story about what happened onto the actual what happened. So yes. your lie, your story, your version of events becomes the actual yes. truth. And then it's only your good friends that'll that'll call you on that and say, don't try and sell that to me because that's bullshit. Indeed. Yeah, that's not the way it happened. Indeed. Know, so. And often your friends, even your so-called good friends, I don't believe you me, I have no, not out there to diss anybody, who, any friend of mine, but uh, even a good friend will be your friend because they find you charming or they enjoy your company or they like to take you to movies. You, it's often very, very difficult at the best of times to have a friend who says, Let's you and I operate within the, the within integrity together. Mm -hmm. Let's do that, regardless. Let's you know. Let's be real with each other. It's hard. It's hard. And there's so many people out there saying, "I want to be real with you. I want to get real." That's a li literally a, a vernacular right off the street. People say, mm -hmm. I, "I'm just being real," but they're not. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. And there's a couple of people who. I won't be, frankly. I look at them, and they're really married to their story, and they really got a lot of jive going on, and I'm simply not interested in forcing them to operate authentically. I'm just simply not. It's just too much work in it, mm. and uh, and I'm not prepared to take the risk sometimes. Frankly, mm. you know, it can be, it can splash right back in your face. You well, know that's pretty I mean? honest. Yeah. And so how, how many sets, wh when are you going on tonight, and how many sets you plan, and what, what can we expect from Big Rude Jake solo? Because... Man, I really got fond of your big band stuff or uh, jazz oh, or whatever. Oh, man. It's, you we got just, so much style and just charisma, and it just leaks out of every note. And that isn't my, typically my genre of music, but I really I found myself putting your playlist on YouTube on a Friday <laughs> night when I'm bouncing <laughs> off the walls and ready to go. And, right. uh, yeah, and I'm like, wow. You know, what am I going to be listening to next? Opera? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what you're going to be listening to next, me. But first of all, I want to know, I want to know. Freaking rock stars. Uh, how can, uh, how can someone log into this show? Uh, you can get us on Facebook. So facebook.com uh, slash Jim Fannin. Uh, so I, right, let me, Facebook. Oh, uh, there is a link. Yeah, this is a private, or sorry, this is a public stream. Uh, they can get us on YouTube or they can get us on Facebook. Dot com no. slash Jim Fallon. Fannin, F A N N O N. And is it J I M F A L L? No, N F A N N O N. F A N N O N. That's how well I know. I will. Uh, I will answer to Jimmy Fallon, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I just sent a link to someone who can probably help me out with that. Yeah. And spread and the word. Maybe put it on my if Facebook not, page. It's on YouTube slash Jim Fannin as well. But uh, yeah, the YouTube link is going. So the YouTube. 
link is just that cell phone with the mic and then okay. this one that's going to facebook should have these mics set up so we get really decent audio and when you play we'll just pull that out so your guitar and your your vocal are sure. equidistant from the mic and that'll give us a good uh, uh sound and then i upload it to the podcast later and then it's oh, then we can share with other people that way. Yeah, it's on iTunes and Stitcher and all that kind so of. So the plan tonight is to play to play about uh, to play three sets starting around seven thirty. Oh, good. We could wait till eight, but it's Sunday. No, you I know. like the early shows, man. Yeah, I'm yeah, home yeah. And back on my couch by ten thirty. That's exactly. Cool. I mean, people got to work for yeah. crying out loud. Mm -hmm. People got to work. Yeah. And this is uh, the, the first song. I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll start off with a song so okay. people who are tuning in now can figure out exactly <laughs> what it's all about. This is a song I wrote uh, a couple of years ago, and I recently recorded a, an acoustic version here in St. Catharines. Okay. Um, and, uh, but it's a little bit older. It's a song that I wrote uh, while I was traveling in France. I was doing a European tour. Okay. And um, we just wanted to put something together for, uh, as a kind of a gift, if you will, to the people who put us up and who did such an awesome job putting together a really remarkable tour. I'm gonna get you a little, uh, sure. So I guess everybody, we're not quite sure. This is, you know, we're kind of, we don't know. I don't know what the audio is going to be like, so let's oh, cross our fingers. Good okay, good. On uh, oh, one feet, it'll, it'll be decent. All right. And then we'll turn this one around, too, so we catch. So uh, you can you can get a version of this song by going to bigrejake.ca uh, right on the front page. You can just click a link and it's and it's right there and you can listen to this version of the song. This is called "I Did It for the Money." Shall I, Jim? Are we good to go? Yeah, hit it. I met a man from Riverside. Who could tell the most amazing lies? I watched him as the crowd would gather, enchanted by his blither blather. He thundered with a grave intent, spawning lies and discontent. The crowd would rage and scream for blood and roam the streets with shoes and clubs. Horrified, I stopped to ask him just what exactly he had possessed him. He gave his answer to my question with a certain smug self of satisfaction. I did it for the money. I did it for the money. Ah, for sacks. Swinging in the pines. Sing a song about a schema and a race against time. In the still of the morning, you can hear the angels yell. Waking up the dreamers on the road of the hell. I'm singing so long, baby, so long. So long, baby, so long. I'll be walking like a Texan on the road of the hell. Well, musical interlude while we yeah, get our that's act awesome. together here. Yeah, I don't know. We lost Facebook, so sorry about that, guys. We're still uh, live over on. We're still live on YouTube, eh? YouTube. Um, not sure why my sound went down, but my phone seems to be no video. Are well, we getting some interesting, uh, in interesting uh, uh, messages coming in from people? Uh, we are. Um, Anyone tell me to get the hell out Jeanette's of here? Jeanette's on. Uh, oh. There's a lot of retracted messages now. What's a retracted <laughs> message? I don't know. One was, oh, there's, there's all the messages are disappearing now. Uh, One why? said, stand up, not you, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> I think she wants to see your jeans or something. Oh, I see. Yes, I, I'm not wearing my regular kind of uh, clothes. I'm, uh, I'm, I, I drove in from out of town, so this is. I tend to wear like <sighs> dungarees and denims when I'm on the road. It's just easier to travel. I got the suit in the car. <laughs> nice, nice. Just pull that up. Oh, uh, yes, of course, yes. Then, uh, so I'm just going to let him know if you want it. Go on over to the uh, YouTube to grab the live stream if you want to hear it live. So, uh, 
Yeah, well, it's like starting all over. It's like uh, it's the second st- take. Are we doing a second take? Yeah, yeah. Did we lose everything? <laughs> no, no. Oh. Uh, YouTube's been going the whole time. Okay. I've given up on Facebook only because okay. uh, I did two tries, and the audio just won't come through for whatever reason. It seems to be coming through on the camera, so I'll have to upload it later. But right. Anyway. So uh, what can we? How's the show different now than uh, anybody that's seen you perform before the solo act? What? Uh, well, that's obviously. a good question. I don't think the solo act has changed a lot, except that I've been working at, at sort of mastering the guitar technique a little bit more. Um, so uh, I've always been a, a finger picker, um, but uh, last couple of years I've been sort of trying to uh, uh, incorporate a couple of other things. So I grew my I grew my fingernails longer so that I could play with hand, yeah, hand. so I could play with a little bit more. Uh, little bit more power um and um using some techniques that some classical guitarists use and stuff um so you know the trick was i think a lot of times a uh, singer songwriters feel you know and this goes right back to you know really talented and famous people um but like leonard cohen and stuff like that he used to sort of laugh and kind of even um sort of belittle his own guitar chops with this idea that somehow or other if you're a singer songwriter you shouldn't really know how to play you know it's not necessary to know how to play very well you can get someone else to do the playing and i think i was sort of operating under that assumption for a long time and then i was listening to some bob dylan and i i realized you know what actually this guy is a really good guitar player he was sort of blown off as being just this folky guy right. but i was listening to his sense of timing and his choices and stuff like that i thought no it's simple, but it's really, really good. And I was listening to his harmonica playing, and I was thinking, yeah, is it really that good? And I thought, yeah, you know what? It is. And I started to realize that I kind of, even though I liked his songwriting, I kind of blew him off as a musician and how really unfair that was of me to do that. And um, that I, I just decided. And then there's a couple of Canadian fellas um, Noah Zacharin, who who has been playing Canadian folk music for a long time, um, who every time I go to see him play, I mean, I'm just completely blown away at how good he is. And so I just said to myself, there is simply no excuse for not being, you know, the best possible guitar player. So all I could say to people is that it will probably sound a little bit better than what it used to sound like because I just spent the last five years trying to master uh, my playing so that when I do a solo show it's not just a good song it's actually a great performance all around cool. so that would be that sounds like a big big difference um, yeah. but when it comes down to it it's just me on the guitar <laughs> so how do you describe the music you play when you got full band I still well you know we're starting to call it blues now Okay. I mean I know that you saw the band when did you see the band I can't remember now to be honest with you but you remember the horn section, yeah. and the, it was loud, mm-hmm. and it was very sensual, mm-hmm. and it was very upbeat. We're still like that. Right. Um, when we got started, and we still use a lot of those exact same horn arrangements, too, and stuff like that. When we got started, you know, there was that thing going on, um, that so-called neo-swing thing or the new swing thing. And, uh, you know, we were strongly encouraged to take advantage of that. And, and we sort of walked into it somewhat trepidatiously because we didn't know whether we fit in. And I don't know whether you know this about me, but I have a tendency to be very ambivalent. Like you think you, I, I, I come across as someone who's very confident and single-minded, but in fact, truthfully, I flip back and forth on things all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I kept flipping back and forth on was whether we want to be a part of the swing thing or not. We would get calls. When we were living in New York, we'd get calls. from oh, we're, we're writing the definitive book on the new swing, the neo-swing movement. We want you to be in it. And I would say, no, thank you. I don't want to be in your book. And other people would say, you know, you know, and then other people would have a big show going on. There's all the swing bands in town, and they wouldn't invite us. And, I, and I, my feelings would be hurt. So, well, well, well make, make up your mind, Jake. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> you can have it both ways. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so uh, there was a little bit. So, um, and in the end, um, I'm, you know, I'm kind of reminded of, uh, you know, Teenage Head. I live in Hamilton now. Mm-hmm. And Teenage Head is still a band that is uh, 
uh, adored. And Dave be, Rave, baby. Dave Rave is now singing. In yeah. fact, I was just hanging out with Dave Rave in, in Montreal a He's couple a of weeks ago. He's a good man. I like Dave. And um, uh, I remember hearing their story, and one of the things that came up was that they were just doing their thing. They were doing their thing. They were reading Cream Magazine, and they were you know, reading Lester Bangs articles, and they were listening to a lot of the same music that a lot of punk bands were listening to, but they didn't know anything about punk rock. They were just doing their thing. And someone came up to them and said, oh, you guys, you know, you guys should market yourself as a punk rock band. And they said, really? Okay. And, well, because uh, the influence was just there from listening to the... Yeah, from the same core sources, you know, bands like... I mean, they got they got their name, uh, Teenage Head, from a song by the Flaming Groovies, which uh, a song called Teenage Head. That's so, and the Flaming Groovies is a is I think it's a San Francisco band that is sort of associated as being one of the earlier sort of '60s uh, proto punk or early punk okay. rock influenced mm-hmm. bands. Simple, uh, straight ahead songs about you know girls and cars and stuff like that. You know, and um, um, you know real simple stuff. The kind of stuff that would influence the Ramones, who you know. Um, you know, who became one of the big three in terms of defining punk rock. So uh, they sort of found themselves landing in the middle of this zeitgeist. Right. They didn't go out and say, we want to start a punk band. And I think that's what happened to Big Root Jake, too, is that we were just sort of going all... We used to call our music whorehouse jazz. We didn't call it swing at all. <laughs> and then finally we thought, well, you know, uh, maybe we should take advantage of this thing. And, you know, you could make the argument that it kind of worked against us. Uh, because the, 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 the swing movement was, uh, you know, kind of a dance craze more than it was a great musical phenomenon. Really? Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, I knew a lot of the great bands out of New York and some of the great bands in Toronto. And it's not like they weren't writing great songs or making great recordings. I'm not saying that. But largely in the end, um, as the thing really started to take, um, uh, sort of start to really burn up. Uh, in popular culture, it was more about the dancing and the style and mm. stuff like that. And the most shallow and the least interesting bands became the most famous. Um, so you know, f- figure it out from there. Is that something you want to <laughs> be a be a part of? So, so um, thirty six thousand views. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, your style is just yeah. so. Cool. That's when we are, are you are you broadcasting this We're, too? No, I just they can't see it or oh. they can hear a little bit of it. This is Queer for Cat. Yes, that was the video there for Queer for Cat. Yeah. I've never seen that one. Oh, you'll like that one. That's a that's a that's a that's a bachelor's video if there ever was. This was my idea, by the way. This is something I would never do ever again as an adult person. But there you go. <laughs> oh boy. Awesome. Yeah, it was kind of a crazy time. That was when we had the record contract, and that's when you know we had other people paying the bills and. You know, I don't think I ever saw a nickel from that record, except for uh, mechanical royalties, which by law. This is what Defiance. No, this is not Defiance. This oh. is yeah, this is Defiance. My mistake. Yeah, this is Defiance. Yes. Ninety nine. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, you know, yeah. So I, in fact, there's a lot of mechanical royalties that I never saw. That I was thinking about get, signing a sub publishing deal with somebody to track them down and try to find my money, but you know, the problem with the dealing with a record company in this situation is that they paid for like four or five tours of Europe. And here's the thing. They, uh, I don't know whether you're aware of this. And there's, if there's people who are familiar with the music industry, they might be bored with this. But I'll, I'll tell you this. When you sign a deal with a record company, it's a little bit like being a private contractor mm-hmm. um, in the sense that they kind of lend you the money and then they determine the terms by which uh, you have you've paid them back, mm-hmm. and the terms are often outrageous. 
because their justification is that so many of the bands that they signed fail that they need to make maximum profit of the few bands that do. So the deal that they sign with you is you're basically covering their ass for the cost of what they paid for you right. and then covering their ass for the cost of what they paid for other people. That didn't go anywhere. And then they make then they make the profit and then you get yours. Um so it's not uh it's not a very equi- equitable business deal, and it's div- and I would have you know there's so many other ways to make a deal with somebody, other than simply uh, saying well we have all the power and therefore you know we'll this we'll have all kinds of terms that severely limit the possibility of you profiting, and then from there there was no accountability, like I haven't seen any of the books I don't know maybe the, maybe the uh, you know f- they own half the publishing of these songs on that record. Maybe they've already been covered substantially. I don't know. It's possible. But there is no recourse for me to, uh, unless I sue them, which, of course, is hugely costly. And it may turn out that, they're, you know, that they don't owe me much, and then it turns out to be a loss for me. But like I say, I mean, that, um, it's, it's an extremely frustrating situation. Mm. Um, we've been extremely, um, we've taken a lot of risks with that record, that particular record right there. We've taken a lot of risks. Is this the same one here? Uh, no, that's an earlier one. What you're doing is you're looking at a recording from our earliest days when we had our in, our first independent release had just come out, and uh, well, this you're is young there. yeah, this is uh, this is like mid late '90s, and this was this song that we're doing here was a bit of a theme song for us. I'll be doing this one for sure tonight. But anyway, so I, I the, you know, at you know, at the risk of sounding a little bit uh, like whiny, I, I mean, things happen the way they happen, and 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 you know, life is good, so I'm not going to worry about it. But the fact of the matter is, uh, I have no way of holding the record count co- company accountable for how much money they made if they made anything at all, mm-hmm. and uh, so that's a problem. And then they discontinued the record. And I did something that you would be, I think that you would uh, resonate with. I um, I called up, I somehow, I picked up the phone and I called up the president of the record company. Uh, um, <laughs> he was often in Holland, so I was able to get through to him. Uh, I guess he was in New York. I just called up and said, I want to talk to Case Wessels. And... Um, I told the, the the gatekeeper that we own publishing together, which is true. I wasn't lying. And I got through the case, and I said, listen, you guys have discontinued my record. I need that to be able to sell this record off the stage. It's an important moneymaker for me. Why don't you give me the license for me to manufacture my own record? And the conversation ended and they said, well, think about it. And two weeks later, some bean counter in New York called me up and said, man, Case Wessels must really like you because I am calling you to authorize that you can publish X amount of your own CD. Now, if you sell them all, you have to report that you sold them all to us. And then the next bunch, we'll have to renegotiate how the sales go. So that was very, very kind of them. And that just took one guy to have the... Uh, to get to the right guy. Get to get to the right guy and have the nerve to make the call. And since then, I've tried to make the call several times, and uh, they've they figured out my little uh, my little scam, and I haven't been Good able play. to get through to them. Right. So I've had to send them registered letters and stuff like that, and no one's really responded. So, uh, so did you get rid of all the CDs that you pumped I up still the have time? a couple more left. Okay. But one day, I'm going to reach my limit. But you see, they don't have any. Here's the thing, and I, I should be careful with what I say online, and this is purely hypothetical. They haven't shown me their books, and I haven't shown them mine. I haven't shown mine to them. So mm. if they really want to know how many CDs I've sold, they could always ask. Right. So far, no one's asked. Hmm. Interesting. The music business has changed so much, man. Like, uh, You think the artists are looking for record deals these days? I'm not. No. I might. I mean, it's different back in the day. If you didn't have a record deal, you were no one. You didn't get published. That's right. You music fact, didn't get out. In fact, when this, with the video that you're looking at right now on your screen, we created that album specifically because we wanted a deal. That's what we wanted, something 
desperate. I wanted the record This album deal. was exa- just searching for a record deal. This was our first release. It was independently released, and we did a lot of crazy things to, uh, to make it uh, attractive to record company people. One of the things we did was that we didn't sell it at shows. We'd simply beg our fans to go down to the music store on Yonge Street in Toronto and buy it in a store so that there was an actual, because this is all before barcodes and things like this. Right. And now eventually we had a barcode. We needed the code. foot traffic. And the yeah, we wanted, we wanted documentation that we were the number one best-selling independent band in Toronto. That's what, and we did it. We were the number one. Indi- but that's because, among other things, we didn't sell the record off the stage where there was no accountability for... Oh, uh, right. See, one of, the, one of the big things that changed in the record industry was that country fella, um, uh, Garth Brooks. He, that was the first sort of... When the barcode came into business, what happened was... See, if you had a band, you had the uh, Jim Tannen band, and you had a record company, the company would report how many CDs it shipped out to music stores. Let's say you shipped out a million records. Then by the fact that the record company had shipped out a million records, you'd be eligible for a gold record because the company had shipped a million. Even though they're sitting on shelves. Even though they're sitting on shelves. A lot of times they are returned. You still got credit for the sale. But now, while we were coming up, with the barcode system um, coming along, People had better, the industry had better track of who was actually making them money. And the first guy to go stupid, crazy, big money through barcode, through, through a barcode system of registering uh, sales was Garth Brooks. And, and that was he one of the things kinda, that- He transformed, like he took country to a new, mm-hmm. he, took, he took country in a new, um, what do you call it? Not progressive Yeah, direction. I guess, yeah, a uh, uh, more um, middle of the road, like it, yes. it wasn't so, far off in the extremes it was more uh, contemporary sure, or it, was more ma- it was mainstream mainstream that's it what was I'm mainstream for, yeah. and he, he really broke, mainstreamed country and he broke mainstream markets which Dolly Parton well, some did. people wouldn't even consider him country yes yeah and Dolly Parton did the same thing Dolly Parton had a lot of crossover hits we call those crossover hits mm-hmm. when you start selling records to an audience that has been designated as being in a different demographic than if your country right was. right and Dolly Parton was success, continues to successfully be a massive crossover hit. One of the singular most successful crossover hits of all time was Elvis Presley, mm-hmm. who at one time had a number one hit on the rhythm and blues charts, the uh, Gospel. rock rock and roll charts, and the, the Billboard 100, oh, okay. all at the same time. Yeah. No one had done that before him. It was, it, mm. it was one of the things that you know, gave him such prestige in the industry. Um, so being a crossover, as you, as you as you intimate, being a crossover artist is uh, a real challenge and a real feather in your cap if you're able to accomplish mm-hmm. that. So, uh, uh, what were we t- what were we talking about? We were talking about um, we were talking about how we yeah, how we wanted to create a record of our of who we were and who our fans were, and that and demonstrate to a record company: you invest in us, and you will make money. And we spent so much time, and none of that worked. We spent seven years trying to get a record deal in Canada. We broke attendance records at various venues across the country. We got heaps of press. That video you saw right there was by the CBC. The CBC were huge boosters of us. We were on we were on TV all the time. There was a year where we were on at least in the face on one newspaper, whether it be a, be it a weekly entertainment rag or one of the three dailies, there wasn't a week that didn't go by that didn't have either my picture or a picture of somebody in the band. Every week. And still, we could not inspire the Canadian record industry to uh, give us a deal. Mm. So we packed up and moved to New York City. Six months later, we signed an international record deal with Roadrunner Records, and we toured the world. Wow. So, I mean, that left me wondering, what the F is going on? (laughs) And I'm still not quite sure what it is, what it is about who we were and what we were doing and saying that got people in the U.S. excited about us and got Canadians to be trepiditious of us. I don't know. I had a, I had a, a drink with the president of a record company in Canada, and he said, Jake, you're my favorite 
band in Canada. And I said, why am I not signed to your record label, Paul? And he said, I just can't get my people behind the idea. So a president of a record company says you're, and they still won't sign you. And one of the big problems was, once again, Jake Ambivalence comes up again because I didn't know whether I wanted to be an independent artist or whether I wanted to be a mainstream artist. And I think a lot of people in the uh, industry in Canada were only interested in mainstream artists. And I was prepared to cross over, start off as an indie and cross over and have a hit in the mainstream. Uh, but they didn't like that plan. And the way I write songs, the songs are wordy and they're not about, uh, you know, teenage romance or whatever whatever works. And I think that the thing we don't get what people why people care about this. We don't understand why this works. So well, it's hard to explain music, eh? Indeed, yeah, indeed. You just you just hooked for one reason or another, and then uh, uh, the greatest joy, one of my greatest joys, is getting hooked by something that you're just totally not into normally. Like like I said, right? You know, swing or whatever uh, you classify Big Rude Jake as. It's I've never listened to that type of music before. Right. So you're my you're my wedge Go into in. the into yeah. that type of music, and yeah. then. You know, you stick with it or you don't or what have you. But like, I was just like, wow, yeah. I'm totally down with this. I remember, yeah. you know, I had my little Garth Brooks phase too when I thought sure. he was cool. And I'm glad I'm over that. But <laughs> 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 And then, yeah, once in a while, like, I mean, I talked myself out of going to C21 Pilots because I, I figured I'd, I'd be there with a bunch of 13, 14 year olds. Right. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I saw that as such a disaster, but. I saw some tape of one of their shows. It's unreal what they're doing on stage. Like for wow, light. and like yeah, you don't go there if you've got uh, you know problems with flashing lights or what have you. Right. But and I consumed their album. It's two guys. Oh no, kidding! A drummer and a bassist. Really? Uh, or a, he, he plays a little bit of guitar and sings and piano and stuff like that. But there's just two guys. Wow. And they're like the, the biggest thing on earth right now. And I, I kind of. USS is kind of in that demo because it's just two guys, right? And they're making a massive, massive sound on stage. And uh, and I'm like, I'm not into this music. Right. And then it just consumed me. That whole album, I just I just, I ate it up. And then uh, just recently, I saw one of their stage shows. I'm like, yeah, I need to see this. You know, I've gone away from the big stage shows. I, I saw Dallas Green. Uh, many years ago, when I was at the station, there was free tickets there. I had four, I picked up four free tickets to go see the City in Color. I liked Dallas Green, and um, it was at the ACC in Toronto. And at, you know, last minute, I called a bunch of my friends. Anyways, I found a buddy of mine, his girlfriend, another girlfriend. We all went to the show. As soon as I sat down in the seat at the ACC, I'm like, I'll never do this again. I was at the back of the arena. Mm. Dallas Green was this big. Yeah. And at the same night, my buddy had a bar in town. He had the Swollen Members in town. Oh, yes. I could have been hanging with them, sound check, yes. you, know, you know, meet the guys, all this yes. kind of stuff. I made the wrong call. I could have been in a club with Swollen Members, even though, you know, you want to see the difference in popularity or what have you or song qualities or artistry or whatever. I, I, as soon as I sat down in that place, I'm like, I don't know if I'm cut out for this because they play here. I, I go to their rehearsals, you know. I'm right. fortunate enough that I've got some friends in the business that they'll actually give me a heads up and say, hey, you want to come watch us jam? We're just rehearsing tonight. We're just right. moving around. Bring some beer and we'll have some fun. That's, I mean, so now if I'm not seeing you in a club like Mate tonight, it would be a great place to see you. Uh, and um, I just, yeah, these big shows. I mean, the the best show for me was David Bowie at the Warehouse. Right. There was 2,000 people there. He was on a club tour that time. I think it was Earthling. Right. So what was the original venue you were speaking of? Was it the the, the hangar, the Air Canada Centre? Oh, was it the ACC? Yeah, yeah. ACC. See, uh, the thing is, that venue was so not built away. for sound. Right. I mean, it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a joke. I don't like going to see big concerts either. I have turned down free tickets or have given away uh, tickets, valuable tickets, to uh, some of my most favorite artists because I says, I'm not going to go see them at that space. It's a waste of time. Right. Yeah, that's how I see it. I, I, I you in get other the words, echo I one hundred percent concur wall with you. And you yeah. Get, you know, who cares if there's twenty thousand people? Yeah, there? I don't that's... get. I don't care. Mm. I don't care. Uh, you know. Um. You know, and uh, so and bad sound is uh, you know, the, what's the 
point. Stadium sound, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's, just, I just, I just don't get Can it. Can you believe we put a stadium sound on the Pro Logic receivers? Like we actually want it to ah, sound like yeah. it's reverbing off the back wall. Well, it's part of the glamour of music and the whole phenomenon of the, uh, you know, of the rock star of this idea that we've sort of the, you know, not so much anymore, but there was a time where, you know, uh, the rock star had sort of essentially replaced the movie star as being the sort of utterly idealized figures uh, to aspire to and to fantasize about and to uh, dream through, you know, fashion models too, you know. And uh, so there was a while there where, you know, people certain, there was a time there right before rock and roll finally kind of sort of started to wither in terms of its mass popularity, it became became replaced by electronic music like house music and mm. and and uh, and and rapping and, and and urban music of various kinds and pre-recorded music, um, you know, um, and you know, record industry people are pulling their hair out, and I'm saying, well, you guys, the, the you know the, the the blush is off the rose, the mystique is gone. You sort of milked this idea of you know the rock star as being some kind of you know contemporary uh you know greek god and he's mm. not he's just he's a guy who plays rock and roll music you know you, you you've you've lost touch with uh what it means to be just a working musician you know and you've deliberately cr created this glamour and i think it actually de deconstructed itself you know, I mean, I heard stories about people who I like. Like I say, I mean, I like David Bowie, for example, and I like Lou Reed, but I heard stories about them, you know, getting so wasted that they left their audience waiting in a stadium for an hour while they, you know, cycled through their high enough to be able to stand up and get on stage. You know, like, yeah. how dare you? Yeah. How dare you? You know, and yeah. people just think that's awesome. Yeah, the rock star life. Yeah, the, you know, they, so they're, they're living, they're sort of vicarious thrills of watching these people, you know, abuse their listeners as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you know, that's probably not a terribly popular point of view. Um, and, and I mean, <laughs> it you know, but, but I just like, you know, to this day, I, I still listen to rock music, a lot of it. Um, but uh, I, the mystique for rock music has long disappeared from me. Uh, I, I even play rock music. I play in two different rock and roll bands, and yeah, I like it other, a lot. the other one in your front? I saw, the, I saw the, you've got a Wikipedia page. I used to have one too. Somebody actually complained to take it down. They actually had me dissolved from Wikipedia. But Why? What's a, I don't, uh, because I said I wasn't rele relevant enough. Like, oh, okay. I don't <laughs> think know, that's the complaints true. you could see, like oh. the guy that was saying, this guy, what? Who cares? Yeah, yeah, really, really. <laughs> this guy deserves a Wikipedia page. Anyway, it was, uh, it, it mentioned, because uh, I just I looked at it briefly last night. Because I don't do a lot of homework before my guests come on, but uh, <laughs> the name of the band you front? Uh, there's a couple of them. I uh, there's a band called the Tennessee Voodoo Coop, which is like That's a rockabilly it. combo. Okay. And another one called the Toronto Straight Eights. Okay. And uh, I used to also work with another band that we're, we've got a great rock and roll album. I hope someday to be able to release it. It's been literally sitting on the shelf for ten years. It's such a great record. The Raging Pistons, such a great band, and uh, I just haven't had the wherewithal, the the. the you know, because I'm more interested in doing the big Jake stuff, and so you know, you have too many irons in the fire, nothing gets done. You know? Right, right. But uh, yeah, I mean, I really enjoy playing rock and roll music. It's fun, it's exciting, and uh, it's a thrill a minute. I get it. I really get why people like it. I really, really do. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wrote a song back in the uh, back in the days when we were doing, uh, we were with a record company called "Let's Kill All the Rock Stars." <laughs> Because I was at, the, at that particular point. I another song you couldn't write today. Yeah, another song I couldn't <laughs> write today. It would be you hate know. speech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, but I was just, I was attempting to uh, sort of uh, explain my contempt for certain attitudes in the in this. And I've actually changed my mind dramatically about it. You know, one of the things I remember when Prince. It's weird how you shift, eh? Yeah, it's feel so strongly about something. Yeah, and yeah. five years later, you're revisiting. You're like, hey, yeah, I'm not that guy anymore. Exactly. And I think to myself, why did I care? I think one of the things that I remember at that time, and the thing about me was that, you know, and this may be a reflection of um, King Frito as well, is that, uh, you know, it was working for me at that time to be belligerent. It was working for me at that time to uh, be caustic 
and confrontational and uh, emotional. It was, mm. or so I thought. And because it helped create this really spicy stage energy and a lot of and and a lot of uh, a lot of power on the stage. And I look back on that. And it's certainly not working for me anymore. Mm. It's just not. Uh, and I jumped to a lot of conclusions about what other musicians were doing. I, if, if Prince was still alive, I'd apologize to him personally because I thought when he changed his name to the, the artist formerly known as Prince, I thought that was some sort of uh, delusional uh, sense of uh, entitlement. And, and, no, he did and, that to fuck the record company. And then I found out he did it to fuck the record company. And, yeah. I, re and I thought, wow, what a great idea. <laughs> So there you go. So I should have given him a chance. So the lesson for me in that is don't jump to the conclusion. We're so judgmental. Yeah, I, I am so judgmental. Oh, I have to are. be. Yeah, we and all then, are. You know what? It's, 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 I'm glad to hear you say that because so few of us are willing to admit. Yeah. And if you believe in a higher power, and I struggle with it, but I kind of do. Yeah. <laughs> I just pray for, for relief of ego, judgment, and pride. Because they are the three filthiest. There things. you go. You know, and I'm not consumed by them, but the little bit that I do have, uh, especially judgment, like yeah. ego, I can, I can, I can temper my ego. I can, I can be humbled, I, you know, and uh, pride, same kind of. But judgment, judgment is, it starts as soon as my feet hit the floor. Okay, so I and, got one and for you. There's discernment and there's judgment. I get the difference between that. Of course. But or factual judgment versus value judgment. I don't understand how I can look at a Oprah Winfrey and hate. I don't know the woman, right? But I, I know her as a like on stage or on the screen or what have you. How can you make that call? Like, but it's no different than me going out and looking at somebody in public and going. Or you meet somebody and the, for the first time, you're just not feeling it. You know, you're just like, you know, I, nah, they, they rub me the wrong. I don't know what it is about them. Even worse, you can't put your finger on what it is that you're judging. Right. That you're turned off about. And, hey, this is, this is the human condition. I'm no different than anyone else, except I think I'm a little bit more aware, hyper aware sometimes, and in tune to it and then because i see it in myself uh, I, ca I can't turn it off i can't not see it i'm like oh oh there's that judgment again but i think if we were more if more of us started out from the, the space of yeah i'm pretty much a hate-filled bigot at heart yeah it's hard work to be tolerant and accepting of different colors and different genders and different sexual identities and all this kind of stuff like you're not you're not born tolerant and accepting. I think you're born the other way, protective of your race and of your religion and your people and your family and ah, but, like the, uh, but the tribal, thing is tribalness. The thing is, though, the tribal uh, paradigm uh, is uh, is an illusion. I don't, uh, you know, uh, anybody can be in your tribe, regardless of their. I tr take it from me. I have walked down the road of life with people from all kinds of backgrounds, and they have been my brothers and sisters. And it's not about, I mean, uh, the, especially the paradigm of race, especially that, and religion. I mean, religion is deliberately div divisive, I think, in some cases. But, uh, but uh, there have been some analysts who have suggested that the whole paradigm of race was created to make sure that working class people don't get together. As long as working class black people hate working class white people and vice versa, that'll prevent uh, that will prevent them from developing a, an authentic uh, democratic revolution that would save the world. That's the, well, a lot, and I and I sincerely believe that mm. uh, it's been you know nineteenth. Uh, uh, our our racial distinctions are a nineteenth century fallacy. You know, uh, it it's just uh, actually a myth, uh, a lie. Um, is you're you're right. We do tend to shelter ourselves. There's no question about it. But our leaders. Our leaders, whom we trust as being parts of our tribe, have misled us to think mm. that that person over there is our enemy, and you know, and that, and that is, you it know, it doesn't take much to stoke it, the fear. It does not. And no, the I hate understand. Inside someone, you just, you know, and also too, there's another thing about that too is when you're born, you can't clench your bowels, so it's natural when you're a baby to shit your pants. 
it comes a point in your development as a human being when you stop shitting your pants. If you're 30 years old and you're still shitting your pants, you got a problem, an unnatural problem. So maybe at one point it was natural for you to shit your pants. It is no longer natural for you to shit your pants. Same with understanding the other. At one point, when you're a child, you're scared of there's, there's, there's only two people in the world. You, maybe Mom sometimes only one person in the world that you fully trust. And everybody else mm -hmm. poses a potential danger. Mm -hmm. But as you grow up, naturally, and you let yourself mature, naturally, this fear, unless you are brainwashed, and I fully believe that this is brainwashing going on here, then you will stop fearing these other people when you but become emotionally you, mature. Yeah, and that's a great, great point. But then as you become a mother, let's say, then everything's a threat again. Uh, yes, because I can see that. Have, it's happened to me. It's happened to, protect, to me. And then it's part of your tribe, and their tribe starts out smaller, and it gets a little bigger and a little bigger. And I'm always I'm fascinated by the kids that, you know, that hide behind their mother. Stranger danger. Like, yeah. That's natural. That's yeah. a natural thing for a kid to, like, no, you're strange. Actually, my daughter, we, have to, hold, we have to hold her back. She'll go and hug a stranger. So, I mean, you know. Yeah, I guess there's two sides of it. You can say either way. No, people are born that way or, or they're not. But Listen, I Jim, I, 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 oh, you're going to get some water? I'll tell you something right now. A bunch of people are going to be wanting me to go have dinner. My folks live in Niagara, and I thought maybe I'd go have a, a, a late lunch with my, with my parents. So I think we might have to wrap this up. Okay, you got time for uh, another song? I think so. Well, we could do it again when yeah. we're a little bit better planned. We will definitely do it again. All right. Yeah. Oh, she's just going nuts. We, so we're not on right now? I can take this? Are we good to go? Yeah. I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna Introduce do a little. yourself, Big Rude. Jake. All right. Uh, <laughs> my name is Big Rude Jake. I was born and raised in St. Catharines, Ontario. Oh, you're a native boy. Yeah, I, I am. I am. Awesome. And um, I usually wear a suit when I play, but I, I now live in. I work in Toronto often, and I live in Hamilton with my family. And um, Jim is an old friend of mine who I met actually in Toronto many, many years ago. And uh, it's hard. Yes, yeah, so we did landmark education together back in the day, and and we both got a lot out of it. Uh, are we allowed to say that without sounding yeah, like a bunch know, of uh, peons? Think, or you know, the people that think it's a cult just don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I had a I read an interesting thing about a cult from someone who said that a cult basically is the dictionary definition of a cult is basically a group of people who adhere to a bunch of. Uh, beliefs and systems that are not held by the majority, or, or, or more so, you can't prove. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you can. Okay, sure. But that, but the the that's the denotation or the definition of a cult. Right. The connotation, of course, is darker and scary. <laughs> and 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 you know, and like you just can't go. And as you know, you just can't go from taking landmark. You know, you just can't go into somebody and start using language that they don't understand. Right. You know, you have to speak to their way of listening, or else it doesn't work. Way of listening. You remember Already, that? Always. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to sort of, you have to use, you know, you have to figure out how they hear things, and you have to speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, so if I was to laugh and say, "Yeah, that's right, I was in a cult. Who cares? It was great," then that wouldn't work. <laughs> but that's the truth. I, 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 I hold a whole, I hold to a whole lot of views that are misunderstood. And uh, I've been blabbing at Jim now for two hours. He's had to listen to all my uh, radical views. And, you know, he's a good listener. I'll give him that. <laughs> I'll give him that. Thank you, boy. Jake. I'll take it, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm just going to do a light song, a song that I hope to put on the new record. We're working on a record in Hamilton called the, the, um, the, um, the Jack Hammer Sessions. And uh, it's going to be a lot of me just playing acoustic guitar. And this is a blues that I'm hoping to put on this.
I had a gal in Baton Rouge who used to want to go cruising every night in my 68 Chevelle with the windows rolled down and the music up loud smoking skunk and uh, getting real swell well she found out she could trade up to a continental rag top she drove it up the lot that same afternoon well she hit that open road and it was out with the old and the e He was a Brooklyn Valentino And a short brim Borsalino And a hooked and crooked Crocodile smile Cracking wise and telling lies With those chocolate brown eyes And a rough and lazy lullaby jive And how many times that I heard she would always prefer a man who was a trusty and true. She strapped on that gigolo, and it was I with the old and the e. Says uh, our love is forever, and she meant it when she said it. Ah, but the shifting sands of circumstance make it likely she'll forget it. I was the one and only one. I was Fortune's favorite son. I was born to a bell in Baton Rouge, but now her love has gone cold, and so it's. Lie with the old and eat in with blue. I said, eat with blue. All right, brother, that's not an easy tune to sing. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you really had to work that one out, eh? Wow. I forgot, man. You can really carry a tune. If oh, there you go. Yeah. I'm just not a, just not a, another pretty face. No, you're definitely not a pretty face. <laughs> Despite what my crutch says. Jeanette, Hot, maybe. Pretty, no. <laughs> yeah, she's, <so> <laughs> she's like, oh, come on. He's hot. Admit it. I'm like, I'll revisit it. Okay. I'll revisit it. <laughs> I will relook at him again with new, fresh eyes, but he's still not, not working a, for not, you, Jim. Not a guy that I put in the hot category anytime. And, a guy, and like I said, I am a guy that um, can appreciate a good-looking man. And, uh, hey, we all got our own tastes. That's right. Is that Lightning Hopkins? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a... Uh, hey, please don't go. It was on your playlist, and I just I just oh, that's a, that's it over. not that's uh that's uh John Lee Hooker. Yeah, I was playing your stuff, and it just carried over. So I appreciate that, man. That's very cool, and uh, thanks for putting up with my uh, my uh, technical difficulties. We're still uh, broadcasting over here oh, on okay. Facebook, Great. just from the camera. This one's got the mics on it, and uh, I'll put that one up on YouTube later, and. Uh, that was really cool, man. So thanks for, again. You're very welcome. It's, uh, you know, with limited resources. And I don't always have a, I hardly ever have a guy behind the camera. 
So I kind of, I'm the producer too. So I'm watching along here with everyone else. And then so thank what? you to whoever it was that said no sound because we were rolling uh, to Elliot Thomas, uh, another uh, local musician here, pretty sure. Um, and it, yeah, he said no sound. So that's the first time I heard of it. So, you know, we did some adjustments and stuff like that. So, so um, this is basically two iPhones on stands. Yeah, with, yeah uh, tripods. Uh, yeah, and this one's just the mic of the phone. This one, you see the blue, the, the black cord goes into the iRig, and the iRig's got XLR ins for the mics. iRig. It's an an iRig, iRig is just like a dual XLR input, okay. and it takes it from the XLR and puts it into the DIN and then into the phone. So that phone right there, the top one, mm -hmm. the one that's highest up, it's recording through these. Oh, like I the, see. It's recording video with these. Oh, I see. And that was like before I did the show, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do a show just from the camera. I don't know why, because I'm a why. radio guy and I'm uh, I'm kind of an audiophile as well, and <clears throat> although I've come to be less uh, concerned with how the audio and video look, I'm an audio guy and I wanted the sound to be good. That's why I put up all this stuff, right? To to deaden it and to you know, and that's why I bought a couple of decent mics and and so that's the way I've done it. But you know, who cares? Really, if if I got big rude Jake sitting here, I really don't care to have it like that. I just want to hear it, right? And I want to see you, and I want to experience it. If I want to hear it, nice. I'll go to Mate tonight, right? But I, cool. there was something in me that well, wouldn't. My wife has wouldn't, been killing me to set something up like this, yeah. so I may ask for your advice. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a lot of it, but I can get you, especially... Well, you got a nice little rig here. I'm looking at that picture. Yeah. That's a nice, soft light on, on yeah. us. That looks good to me. Yeah. That looks good. And it seems bright when you're here, but it looks a lot better. And if you don't use the light, then it's 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 really dark. And did you just did you get a special light for that? No. Did you come up with that, no, that wax just, paper yeah, uh, thing? Yeah, no, that's... Uh, it's funny. Uh, it was just too bright. It's a halogen. It's uh, That's on loan. My mics were on loan at one time, too. Um this is a buddy of mine. He's a, he's a contractor. And he had it in his garage. I'm like, hey, can I borrow that? And he came over. You know, this is about a year ago, probably. <laughs> he came over a few weeks ago. And he's like, is that my construction light? I'm, I'm like, damn, I should have. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to put that away before you came in. He says, Mike's been asking me for that. I forgot you had it. And so, yeah, the halogen light, and they're, they're really hot as well. Uh, but hot from a light sense, too. Uh, I just had to to dim it a little bit so yeah i just thought well, are what these the also the phones that do you, these phones strictly for your thing no, or this is just an iphone that's the one i use now this is my old iphone 6 that's and an I, iphone 6 yeah and they take really good uh video that's an iPhone. that's my but you're iphone showing, oh you're only recording sound on that no this is audio and video through the phone okay this is audio and video through the mics okay um and so yeah that's and then why you mix them together later or no, just, it goes. The I rig helps you put into one signal. This I might have to piece together. Like when I, if I I've had a technical difficulty right. about a year ago, mm -hmm. and I had to put the first half of the interview from the phone because this one filled up, and I had a so, and then I had to piece it together. So there was low quality audio, and then all of a sudden it came right. in good quality because I, I could piece them together. And yeah, I just uh, I do very little editing. There's no commercials that I'm uh, I'm doing. Um, I, I do I do talk to everyone about ricochet water because this is the best water. It's not RO. It's ricochet. It's different. Okay. And so it tastes better. Other than that, there's no commercials. I do very little editing. Uh, sometimes I'll put some titles up on it. I'll put Big right. Rude Jake, maybe your website, and then, you know, find me on YouTube if you want to see more of it. Um, so, no, I just uh, upload it at, with limited resources. And, you know, we don't have, all have the money to be Joe Rogan with the TriCaster. Because right. the TriCaster will put it out to Facebook, YouTube. It, like, it puts it everywhere live. Right. Uh, so I can only go as live on as many streams as I have devices. And, and that's, you know, at this stage, that's that's fine with me. So um, and, and at this stage, also, two inputs, right? So if i got a band here, we only have two mics. Um, so if we got five guys... Then you got to share the mic type of thing if you right. want if you want it to be up and close. But uh, so yeah, I just uh, this way if I broadcast it live to to Facebook, I can save it to the phone. Then I can do what I want with the video. Right. 
So, uh, but yeah, I'm glad to help you out anytime. And so, thanks uh, for your time and for putting up with the. You're very well. Technical difficulties. It was a great and, dry run. I yeah. learned a lot, and I really appreciate you being so quick to say, "Hey, no, come back. Let's do this again." Yeah. Because, yeah. Um, no, no. You, know, you never know when it's going to touch someone, and or they say, "You know what? That big rude, uh, that big rude Jake show." And he said something that tweaked it in me, and I've been right. practicing my guitar ever since. Or there you, you go. know what I mean? You know, that's yeah, all yeah. we can ever hope for is to be, an, you know, a positive influence. And you on never know life, what right? you say no. and do that may have a positive, or sometimes, unfortunately, I don't want to dwell too much on it, but sometimes negative. Like sometimes you can have a, you know, every once in True a while, enough. every once in a while. That's why it's so important to be personally responsible, right? Because every once in a while, people have said things to me off the cuff that have landed in a very negative way. Mm -hmm. Like my mom. <laughs> Bless her. My mom <laughs> used to talk about some of the used to used to gossip about some of the um, rock and roll kids at our church, and um, like kids who would like you know dressed to church with Elvis glasses on and stuff like this, you know. And I have to admit, it did look a little ridiculous. Anything goes at my church. Yeah, <laughs> almost anything goes. I mean, it's but this was back in the seventies. Individualism's big now. <laughs> the, the point. The point is that. Uh, I when I started in the music industry, I literally didn't tell my parents because I thought they'd be crushed and be disappointed by it. Really? Because of some stupid thing that my mom said off the cuff about some other kid who wants to be a musician. Wow. So you gotta be so careful. You hung on to that forever. It's amazing yeah. how we develop stories yeah. when we're young and there we you carry go. them on till we're fifty go. and sixty and seven, and we die with them sometimes. Yeah. You know. And I could have I could have been asking for my parents' support the whole time. And that's another thing about asking for help is is. You know, from people, from reliable people, of which we all have in our lives. Whether we want to admit it or not. Precisely. Yeah. We want to believe our story that we're all alone in the world, mm. something like that. And then and then we ignore people who are could be of great benefit. Mm -hmm. You know, we deliberately avoid being happy and fulfilled because we want to believe some ridiculous story about that we're all alone in the world. You know, I mean, and th I think I was there to some degree, at least to the respect that I kind of squeezed my family out of my career. I didn't tell. I was ridiculous. I was starting to develop fame, and, and I, I still hadn't told my, my My dad finally calls me and said, what the hell are you doing? We never hear from you. We don't know what you do for a living. What's going on? <coughs> no, we you should hear like that. I'm Big Rude Jake. I'm a musician, actually. <laughs> he said, oh. Where have you been hiding oh, this yeah. for the and last 20 years? And that's the thing. Is like when I was a kid, I, didn't, I, 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 took guitar, I took piano lessons, and I took guitar lessons, and I was terrible. I didn't practice. I wasted money going to lessons where I wasn't prepared. It wasn't until I became an adult and I decided I wanted to become a musician that I started developing any chops. So my parents didn't see me as a musician. They saw me as someone who was resisting being a musician. So the thing, what the, you're, you're, you're what? You're a musician? What? When did, when did that happen? <laughs> why, and why didn't you let us know? Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that too. It reminds me, like I had a little uh, uh, cardiac episode this, this summer, pericarditis. It, it, was, it was turned out to be, it was a pretty big deal. I didn't tell anyone. Uh -huh. I was in the hospital for four days. Oh, for I told like three people. I told my, you know, my dad and a couple of important people in my life. And then, uh, for instance, like my pastor, Pastor Bill, he's a good man. He's a good-looking volleyball coach. He's got a nice family. Like He's not like the little Catholic churches where I come from. Not that that's a bad thing, but he's just a, he's just a really solid dude. Right. And he's like, um, why didn't you text me? Yeah. Like, I would have come to visit you. Yeah, you were there for four days, and By then yourself. and I think, yeah, exactly. And I Idiot. think I would have spent an hour <laughs> alone with Bill, my pastor. Like he's a good guy. That would yeah. have been a valuable experience. But no, I had to, you know I don't. I'm not the uh, although uh, you know I thought about it. Instagramming from my bed. Well, it looks like I'm gonna be here for a while. <laughs> that's a, the that's the other extreme. Yeah, where you're just attention seeking on yeah, this. No, yeah. no, you're that's talking not about connecting me. and having authentic relationships. That's what we're talking <laughs> yeah. about here. Neither being a neither, neither being being a, a social media slut yeah. or some uh, you know delusional lonely person; those are opposites, and they're you know yeah. they're, they're, neither of them are helpful. Equal, equally as bad. equally as bad, yeah. All right, brother. So All right, such a pleasure to be on your show. We'll do it again. All soon, right, okay? I appreciate it. Bro. All right.